Today, you're going to hear from Bob Proctor. I've put together some motivational clips, some beautiful insights from this man who was a towering figure in the world of self-help. In 1973, he founded his company and has been celebrated ever since. Being an entrepreneur, a teacher, a writer, a business consultant, and counselor, Bob Proctor is famous for his motivational speeches on how to be a better version of you. He has been on his mission to advise people to strategize their ideas in such a way they would be able to create extravagantly glamorous and fulfilling lives for themselves for more than 40 years now. He has passed away. Rest in peace, Bob, but his teachings have touched and fulfilled the lives of millions. Hopefully, some of the ideas and the thoughts and the insights that he gives over today will be helpful for you as well. Now, let's clearly understand this is what I've got on the screen here is what we do far too often. Far too often. We let the bank balance control our head. Now, I never let that happen. Do you know why? I never look at the balance. I've never balanced a checkbook in my life. I've never, and I don't intend to ever do it. I don't want to do it. I think it's terrible work. I don't want to do it. Now, does somebody have to do it? Absolutely. And I've got people working with me. They're, Sandy Gallagher is a genius at that. She's just absolute genius. And so I like her being able to do what she's a genius at. I don't want to do it. I don't want to let results control my thinking. I prefer to do this. Now look here. I'm going to take this, and this is what I'd suggest you do, and rub this out. Rub present results out. And then start thinking here. We know that there's a power that's flowing into our consciousness. We know that. And this power, as it flows in, it just is. It's neither positive or negative. It just is. And we can make out of it anything we want. I've got the idea here. I'm not telling you what it is. I'm going to show you what it is. Mikey and I are going to discuss it some more. We get this idea here. Now, she's going to take this to the marketing team, and they're going to be, start talking about it. Now, let's understand this. You can do what I'm suggesting here. And when you do this, you then become, this, this is you here, you become like you're magnetized. And, 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 and you just, it's like, whatever idea you hold, you impress upon your subjective mind, this is the part that you've got to try and get straight. This part here, okay? Your subconscious mind is part of everything. Everything's hooked together. Remember I say the love is a vibration. There's no line of demarcation. They're all joined together. Each one is hooked up to the one above and the one below. That's everything in the universe is connected like that. Now, and you can change it. You have the creative ability to change it. You see this here? Here's a, an hourglass. The sand in the glass is running here. It never stops. The glass that's holding the sand used to be sand. Now think what I'm saying. The glass that's holding the sand used to be sand. But we have learned how to alter the molecular structure, change the vibratory rate of the energy that we call sand, then we can turn it into glass, then we can mold it whatever way we want, and we can make an hourglass out of it. It's energy. The energy that we call that is glass, we call this sand because of the vibration it's in, we call this wood because of the vibration it's in. Okay? We call this skin, we call this hair, we call this cloth. It's all energy and it vibrates. Everything is hooked together because every frequency is connected to the one above and the one below. When you get emotionally involved with an idea and you really get it to sink into your consciousness, you move your body into a vibration, but the mind body is in the vibration and you are in sync intellectually, emotionally, and physically. The consciousness and the subconscious and the body, all in the same vibration. You have an, a, strong, a strong attractive force set up. 
And that attra strong attractive force is going to start attracting to you from every side of the universe. Whatever is necessary to manifest that idea in physical form or in results. That is the result you want to see. Not the, not the one that exists now. When you look at the present result, that's thinking in reverse. And that's what this night chapter 9 is about. Most people think in reverse. Do not think in reverse. Quit looking backwards. It's a waste of time and a waste of energy and it's very destructive for your own future. Hello there and welcome. Have you ever thought of failing your way to success? Think about that for a moment. Do you know that anyone that enjoys any kind of success feels their way there? That's right, they do. I want you to think of this for a moment. See this little light here? Someone gave me this as a gift. This is a replica of the light that uh, Edison built. And you know, he spent a long time before he got this thing to glow. He really did. And He started off because he had an image of it in his mind. But every time he tried, he failed. And he failed 3,000 times, it's been said. Now, I've never really talked to Edison, so I don't know if that's accurate, but I have an idea it is. 3,000 failures. Now, a reporter asked him one time how he felt about failing 3,000 times. He said, I didn't fail 3,000 times. He's there with 3,000 steps to get to where I'm going. Do you know, if I were to tell you all the sad stories about it's got me to where I am, I would really spoil your week. And there's been some real sad stories. I think it might even make me cry again. But I've had so many failures that I wouldn't even want to guess at it. I have, I've blown everything I had three different times. I never let it bother me much. Well, one time I did. Now, one time I did. In fact, I was mentioning to, to uh, Scott Edwards the other day, just yesterday, I think. I, um, I blew it. I, I lost everything. I, when I bet on me, I bet the farm. And if I miss, then, you know, the whole thing goes up. And I guess I just wasn't ready to handle it. I sat in the house in darkness, I didn't want anybody to talk to me, just leave me alone. And I sat in the living room in the dark, I had the curtains closed and I sat there for almost a month feeling really sorry for Bob. And then one day I got an idea and I went and I got two recordings, long playing records by Earl Nightingale. He had narrated the entire book, As a Man Thinketh by James Allen. And I got those two records out and I started to play them. And before they were over, I had the curtains open. I went downtown Toronto and I bought myself a brand new Cadillac. I thought, what would sort of inspire me? I thought I should get a new car. So I went and got one. And you know, I have found that every time I failed, I moved closer to the goal. You see, if you knew how to do it now, you'd be going sideways. When you're going after a goal, you're going ahead. And because you're going where you've never been, you're going to make mistakes. You don't know it all. You have perfection within you, and the objective of life is to bring that perfection to the surface. That's exactly what this guy did. Well, you're going to make a lot of mistakes bringing that to the surface. Those mistakes are steps to where you're going. I often tell salespeople that are afraid to make a call just to get out there and make a call. And their objective isn't to sell. Their objective is just make the call. If you make the call and you're afraid and you do it, you're successful. You've accomplished what you want to do. You made a call. And after you get comfortable making those calls, then you can start to polish up your presentation and odds are pretty good, you'll start making sales. And if you keep polishing up your presentation and working at getting better, you're going to master a thing called selling. But if you think that you're going to enjoy great success and it's just one win after another, 
You're kidding yourself. It just doesn't happen. I don't even know anyone that's pulled that kind of a deal off. If they did, they were cheating or lying. Now, I've enjoyed a respectable amount of success so far, not as much as I want. I've got goals that I haven't got any idea how I'm going to get there, but I know I'm going to get there. And I've made all kinds of mistakes. But you know something? I've always kept going. I just keep going, I keep going, I keep going. And every time I feel like quitting, I think of the time that I locked myself in my living room, closed all the curtains, and sat there for a month feeling sorry for me. I don't like feeling sorry for myself. It doesn't bring on a good feeling. I like to feel good about myself. And I feel good about myself when I know I'm giving it the best shot I've got. And that's what I want to suggest you do. Feel your way to success. Go on out and do it. Go blow it. Go on, fail. And I guarantee you, you're going to wake up one day and you're going to be earning a lot of money. You're going to feel real good about you. And somebody's going to say, how did you become so successful? And say, you know, I'm glad you asked me. Let me tell you a real sad story. In fact, I've got about 500 of them I'm going to share with you because that's how I got here. And that's how you're going to get there. Feel your way to success. Attracting what you actually want. I think James Allen put it very well in his little book, As a Man Thinketh. He said, you don't attract what you want. You attract what you are. Now think about that. If you want to attract what you want, you've got to see yourself already with it. You've got to understand that you've already got it. First of all, clearly understand this. Nothing is created or destroyed. That means everything's already here. If not in one state, certainly in another. Where did the iPhone come from? The iPhone came from a series of ideas that individuals entertained in their mind. And they kept holding the idea until the stuff came to them that enabled them to build the phone. The stuff had already been here. Nothing is created or destroyed. All science, all theology teach that. If nothing's created or destroyed, everything that is already here. Our problem is we've got to wait until we see it outside before we believe we've got it. Start dealing with the non-physical world, with the invisible world, with the world that you can't see through these little peepers that you've got here we call eyes. Start to see yourself mentally. You've been given the faculties to do that. Use your imagination. See yourself already in possession of the good you desire. That will flip your mind onto a specific frequency. And you do think on frequencies. It's on that frequency that good you desire is going to start coming toward you and you will start moving toward it. If you want to attract what you actually want, you've got to see yourself now already with it. And no, it's only a period of time until you moving toward it and it moving toward you and you become one with it. That is how it's done. James Allen was right. You don't get what you want. You get what you are. You've got to become what you want. You've got to realize that the minute you hold your mind in harmony with the good you want, then you've already got it. It's only a period of time till it manifests in physical form. You've got it intellectually, and you can talk to somebody about it. You've got it emotionally, you can share your feelings. It's only a period of time till it moves into form. That's called the perpetual transmutation of energy. That is a law, the first law of the universe. Do it. See yourself with what you want. This is Bob Proctor. Thank you. Do you know, the Apostle Paul said something that was very good. And I choose to believe the Apostle Paul is one of my favorite guys in history. And see... His name used to be Saul, and he was a bit of a orangutan, screwed up, you know, did a lot of things the wrong way, got himself into jackpots all kinds of times. And then he was reborn. He discovered his true potential. He got some good advice, and he followed it, and he became Paul. Well, he said the greatest is love. Now, the more you study this, the more you're going to incline to agree with it. So we've got to ask, what is love? Well, I want you to think of this. When two people fall in love, what do we mean by that? Now, here around Proctor Gallagher Institute, we deal with three parts of the personality, the conscious mind, subconscious body, the thinking mind, the feeling mind, and the instrument or the body that we move through. When two people are in love, their conscious minds have a rapport. They enjoy talking about the same things. Intellectually, they're enjoying the same subjects, so there's a rapport. They're in sync. They're emotionally involved in the same ideas. Heart to heart, they're in tune. 
Okay? They're emotionally involved in the same ideas. Then they generally have a great physical relationship. Why? Well, because the physical is nothing but an expression of the intellectual and emotional. So when you find two people have a great intellectual, a great emotional, they will have a great physical relationship. Those two people are in love. They are in love. When you find a person doing very well in business, they're in love with what they're working at. They're in sync with it intellectually, emotionally, and physically. Their whole being is locked into it. Love is the greatest thing. Love what you do. I went to visit Earl Nightingale one time way back in the 60s. I'll never forget it. And I was leaving. I felt I was so grateful I had an hour of his time. And I said, Earl, what's the real secret? I mean, what's the big deal? Well, he said, there isn't any big deal, Bob. I mean, there isn't any secret. It's simply a matter of sitting down and determining what you really love to do and then make a decision to dedicate your life to it. Man, did I get excited. He said, the problem with most people is they don't know what to do and they never make a decision to dedicate their life to anything. I got so jazzed. I knew exactly what I would love doing. I would love to do what he was doing. I made up my mind I wanted to do it and I wanted to do it with him. And I made up my mind I would make a commitment to that for the rest of my life. You know something? That's exactly what I've done. I love what I'm doing. I love it. I absolutely love it. Now, when you love doing something, you'll run, baby, and you won't get weary. You'll walk and you won't get tired. You know why? You're a free flow. The energy is just freely flowing through you. You are the greatest instrument then that God's got. You're here to do God's work. What's God's work? God's work is creation. God's the creator. You're creating God's image. You've been given creative faculties. Fall in love with what you do, and you'll be creating great stuff wherever you go. Love what you do. Love the people that you're working with. Fall in love with the idea of love. It's when intellectually, emotionally, and physically, all three parts, you're a triune being, you live simultaneously on three planes. Get all part of you. The intellect, the emotion, and the physical. Locked right into what you love doing. You'll have a great life. J.C. Penney, when he was 92, somebody asked him, how are you doing? Well, he said, my eyesight is fading me. But he said, my vision has never been better. <laughs> Van Gogh one time was asked, how do you do such beautiful work? He said, I dream my painting, and then I paint my dream. Vision, vision. Where there is no vision, the people will perish. What is vision? Vision is a long range view of a multiplicity of things you want to do. Now your purpose is why you're living. Your vision then, you want everything to be on purpose. Your vision then is like a funnel coming out of your head, going off out into the future. It's a long range picture of a multiplicity of things you want to do. Your goal is taking a bite out of your vision. So sit and think. I'm God's highest form of creation. I've got mental faculties that go beyond the scope of my imagination. And build a long range vision of all the magnificent things you want to do. Live with a vision. If you're not doing that now, you're missing something in life that's very valuable. Stop whatever you're doing right now and totally relax and build a vision of doing all kinds of things in the future. Future, They all blend in together, but they're all different and your life just gets bigger and better and bigger and better and bigger and better. That's the vision of your life. Vision, it's a beautiful picture. It's like a movie in your mind, a vision. You build the vision with your imagination, not with your eyes, but with your imagination. See, a person that hasn't got this, where there is no vision, the people will perish. It's so true, so true. Build a vision. I wish you could see what I can see, where I'm going, man, I've got the most beautiful trip planned for me. When I leave here, tonight, tomorrow, the next day, next year, five years from now, 
I've got a picture of where I'm going, things I'm going to do, the millions that we're going to serve. They're all part of my vision. What's your vision? Could you take and draw a picture of it? Could you write a picture of it? If you can't, you may not have one. Now remember what I said? Your purpose in life, that's the reason you get out of bed in the morning, your reason for living. Purpose, vision, and goals, then you have a vision. That's a long range view of a multiplicity of things that you're gonna do. You love them all. And they're all on purpose. Your goal is taking a bite out of the vision. That's the part you're gonna do right now. You might look at that article. There's an article, Purpose, Vision, and Goals. We'll give it to you. Here we're just almost on top of the new year. Have you got your goals set? You know, I'm just looking down at my desk, and I was thinking, this was a goal of Steve Jobs. Think and Grow Rich, that I've been reading now for 57 years, was a goal of Napoleon Hill. What's your goal for 219? Do you know that most people don't reach their goals? Do you know there's a difference between setting a goal and achieving a goal? Now, almost everyone knows how to set a goal. They go into their imagination, they pick out what they want, and they write it down. But you know something? 90-some percent never reach it. And I know why. Setting your goal is an intellectual exercise. It's using your higher faculties. Reaching a goal is lawful process. It's turning the idea over to the universal subconscious mind. You've got to learn how to get these two parts of your mind working in harmony to reach a goal. January the 10th, 11th, 12th, and 13th, I'm going to be conducting a seminar in Los Angeles, California. We're going to stream it all over the world. So if you can be in LA, get out to the seminar. Otherwise, stream it. Leave your information. It's one of the most important programs that you will ever attend. It'll teach you the difference between setting and reaching goals. And that's something that only around 3 or 4% of our population really understand. The average individual is self-serving. They're, they're, they're always focused on themselves. I want you to just pay conscious attention today. Write a little note maybe that you fold up and carry in your hand. Why do you do that? Just to remind you that you want to pay attention to everybody you meet. What are they doing? Are they really trying to help other people or are they really trying to find help for themselves? Are they self-serving or are they serving others? You're going to find the people that are the best at serving others. They are the big winners in life. Figure out how you can improve the service you're rendering. Now, I'm probably a little older than you, so I've been running around the park for a, quite a bit longer than you. And I have learned one thing really well in life. That my success, my happiness is going to be dependent on how good I get at serving you or serving other people. I spend most of my time trying to figure out how to help other people. I do. I don't spend much time. You know, I get almost everything I want. Almost everything I want. There's very few things I can't even think of anything I want. Christmas, birthday comes along, well, I don't know. I, you know, send a donation in my name. I, like, I don't want anything. And it's got to a point where I just want to serve others. So all I want to do is serve others. Now, I'm a pretty happy guy, pretty healthy guy, pretty wealthy guy. What have I done? I have just learned how to fall in love with the idea of serving other people. Our company's success is going to be dependent upon how many people we can serve and how well we serve them. We have a phenomenal staff of people in Proctor Gallagher Institute. I choose to believe that we have, I, I, just, I just love our staff. We have some of the most phenomenal people. And we've got people come, like we have a guy, Tommy Collier. The guy is a creative genius. He came, he wanted to come to work with us. I said, you want to work with us? I thought, wow, guy's so good. You will attract good people if that's all you want to do. Just serve other people. That's what we do. And we've got everybody in the company. That's where they're going. We got some pretty happy people, very successful people. And all we did 
is focused on serving other people. Companies that are enjoying the most success, they're the ones that provide the most and best service. This is the way it works. It always has worked that way. And I'm inclined to believe that it always will work that way. Fall in love with the idea of serving others. You'll be very happy, but you'll also be very successful. You can give it a whirl. You'll find out I'm right. It's Bob Proctor. Thank you. Now, you see here on page six, it says money is a servant. It's a servant. Now, there's a myth about money. It says another myth about money, like you accept money, is that it only comes as a result of luck or good fortune. Well, of course, that is really silly. That's not true at all. But that's the concept that a lot of people operate with. Okay? Now, if you move over onto page seven, we're talking about money's got to circulate. It's not only a servant, you've got to keep it moving. I have some money here in my pocket. I keep it in a little envelope. And uh, this stuff here is money. The truth is, this represents money. Now, this used to be paper. Now I think it's plastic. You know, use it as a fan. But this is, it, it's a servant. And you can put this to work. You've got to keep it circulating. Now, we tell a story in here about um, uh, Mr. Chapman. Now, Mr. Chapman was an interesting guy. He lived on the street that I lived on as a little boy. And my brother and I had a paper route, and we sold papers to the people on that street. We had 300 customers, went right from Kingston Road to the Lake Ontario. And almost every house we had as a customer. Mr. Chapman had a big house not too far from our house, up on a hill. It was an old house. And one day, Mr. Chapman, we used to feel sorry for him. He was, he was hunched back. He was a little man. He used to push a little cart around, and he collected junk. His wife was a, a tall, thin lady, and uh, she always wore just skimpy clothes, like uh, a, a cotton dress with a, maybe a little coat, running shoes. And she would be off up the street. She went to clean houses or clean offices. They, we thought they were really poor. Well, one day we opened the paper. We went up the corner to get the papers. And when we got the delivery of the papers, it was headlines that Mr. Chapman had died. It was a headline in the Toronto Star. They found $100,000, $100,000 in a jar in the house. Here he is collecting junk. And he had $100,000 in a jar in the house. Now, I just looked up that, that up this morning. That's equal to $1,087,798 in today's dollars. That's what $100,000 in 1947 would have been. Uh, in today's dollars, it would be over a million, a million eighty-seven, eighty-eight thousand. He had all this money, and he had it in a jar. It was serving no one. It wasn't circulating. And we were shocked that he even had it. So what we've got to understand is that saving it like that is silly. Like here, the money that's in this envelope in my pocket, it's useless as long as it's in an envelope in my pocket. It does no one any good. You may be saying, why are you keeping it there? It won't stay, in <laughs> it won't stay there very long. I'll have it circulating in a very short period of time. Now. If you come down to the bottom of page nine, these are just basics. We're talking about here, about a prosperity consciousness exercise. Now that we have touched upon some of the characteristics of money, let us turn briefly to a simple technique, which you can begin using immediately to start attracting the amount of money that you desire. Now think of that. You can literally attract to you the amount of money you desire. You've got to ask yourself, where do I stand with money? Well, let's look at this again. Hello there and welcome. I think it's time to grow up. I'm sitting here and I'm reading Power of Awareness by Neville. I got to share it with you. He said, the future must become the present in the imagination of the one who had wisely and consciously create circumstances. We must translate vision into being thinking of into thinking from. Imagination must center itself in some state and then view the world from that state. Thinking from the end 
is an intense perception of the world of fulfilled desire. Now, I want to repeat this, and I want you to really listen carefully to each word I'm saying. The future must become the present in the imagination of the one who would wisely and consciously create circumstances. I think right now everybody wants to create circumstances because they don't like the ones they find themselves in. But you see, you cannot change the circumstance you find yourself in. You can only change your perception of them. And when you do that, you change the circumstance. So we say here, the future must become the present in the imagination of the one who would wisely and consciously create circumstance. We must translate vision into being. Thinking of into thinking from. Imagination must center itself in some state and then view the world from that state. See yourself where we want to be and then be there. Thinking from the end is an intense perception of the world of fulfilled desire. That is so cool. Thinking from the end is an intense perception of the world of fulfilled desire. So what are we doing? We're building a goal and then we see ourselves already having accomplished the goal. Thinking from the end is an intense perception of the world of fulfilled desire. Already got it. I don't have to get it, I've already got it. That's an intense perception of the world of fulfilled desire. In other words, you got it, it's here. Now think, are you thinking from the end or are you thinking of the end? If you're thinking of the end, you're thinking it's way out there. If you're thinking from the end, you're part of it. See, the end result has already happened in our mind. We're creative beings, we're God's highest form of creation. We can create in our consciousness the kind of person we want to be and then be that person. And that's what he said here. We must translate vision into being. So we don't just visualize it, we be it. If you haven't got this book, you gotta get it. I'm reading on page 138. Now there's different books, Power of Awareness. Get one with this red band across the bottom. Because this has, it also includes awakened imagination. And that's really what you wanna do.